I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit to privilege confess sin if necessary. It would be necessary if you have unconfessed sin because carnality is there and you can't. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. <clears throat> First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you, and that cleansing brings you back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and at least in the teaching hour, and hopefully on into your life in the application part. It's called walking by the Spirit. Walking by means of the Spirit. Father, we're thankful today for these who have come our way by the automobile and the internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this Christmas series as we look at the life of Joseph out of Matthew 1, 18 through 25. We come to realize, Father, the importance <clears throat> of not only hearing the word, but believing it, applying it, and bring it into that dynamic fulfillment of the directive will of God and moves us on, Father, into our maturity life. Uh, so I pray as we look at Joseph in this story, he's called a righteous man. And he is a believer in spiritual maturity. We call it experiential righteousness. He's a guy who is learning to walk by faith and not by sight. And he's trying to be consistent every day with that walk. We pray, Father, we would learn about that today because we see a man who finds struggle in it because sometimes the things we're asked to walk through seem impossible and we get through them and we realize what's impossible for man is possible with God and there's our great lesson in transformation. Help us understand these things so we look at the life of Joseph in the story of the birth of Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, we used the outline of uh, the Greek outline of Matthew 1, 18 through 25 with the conjunction day. You can't always see it. In the English, because they translate it differently, they might say but might say and, might say then. It's used all these ways in our Bible. But what's interesting, the Greek language, they, they use day with the idea of now. And it's current events de dealing, dealing with current, current events with a bunch of problems in your life or at least a big problem in your life that's just about absorbed all of your energy and breath. And so day is used to lead us off from the genealogy into the actual birth of Christ and how it affected individual lives that were intimately engaged in the directive will of God in the birth of Christ. And we're, we're looking at Joseph. He's called the husband of Mary. But day is used in introduce verse 18. Day is used to introduce 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24, 25. And we will use that structure to go through the Christmas story uh, this week. I will do some on Tuesday, some on Wednesday, and some on Sunday, all from Matthew 1, 18 through 25. That would be my series. The other guys will come in and, and they, will, they will share with you their Christmas ideas. But this is mine. So here we are in Matthew 1, 19. And I wrote it at the very top of your paper, the verse. And I want to show you some things about it. Notice it begins, and now, that's day. They, in my opinion, all of the days should stay now because it's current events of the fulfilling of the genealogy of 1 through 17. Notice the, the, the subject. See, the, the verb is being. The subject is, 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 is kind of a lengthy one. We have Joseph, her husband, being. 
Joseph, her husband, being. And um, the word being, notice, is, is I, me, absolute status quo verb of existence. It's important to know. And it's a present active participle, nominative, singular, masculine. Uh, Joseph, her, let's go back to Joseph. Joseph, her husband, being what? A righteous man. That, that's, that's experiential righteousness. I mean, he's a mature believer, and now he's got a big, a big test on him. And this is chi. This is, the, the, this is a conjunction chi, but it's adjunctive. The reason it's adjunctive is because notice something really important. Look back, look, look back at the word being. I mean, it's a present active participle, nominative, singular, masculine. That's NSM, nominative, singular, masculine. See the chi and see the word not wanting. That's the negative may, right? Then watch present active participle, nominative, singular, masculine. See that? See, they're identical. When they're identical, then that chi takes an adjunctive. These, thing, these two participles are attached. They are linked inseparably one to the other. <clears throat> okay? Now watch what these two participles say. They address J J Joseph. They address Joseph as being a what? A righteous man. Being a righteous man. And then Kai says he's got a big issue that he's addressing, not wanting, that's Thalo, is T-H-E, is T-H-E-L-O, is how that should be spelled. Thalo. It's an emo, it's a, it's a word of emotion uh, or high drama. It's not T-H-E-O-L, it's T-H-E-L-O. And not wanting, that's a negative may, M-E, not wanting, present act part of, so to disgrace her, you got those two? See, see those two participles conjuncted uh, that are united, inseparably united in this idea. Joseph, who is betrothed in verse 18, engaged to be married, identified as betrothed, identified as Joseph is her husband. That's all right. Uh, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wishing to doubt, to disgrace her, not, not wanting he, he, an emotional desire, not, not wanting or wishing to disgrace her. Notice that's an aorist active infinitive. Desiring, now this is desired, is really important. That's your main verb. That MV is main verb. Now this is really important because both of, see, a participle is not a mood. It's a verbal, uh, it's a verbal adjective and uh, the, the infinitive is a verbal noun and both of them have to have a main verb. They're both connected they're both identified and connected with the main verb. See, they look like a verb, but they're not a verb. They're not a mood. You know, you have a, you have a tense, you have a voice, and you have a mood. A participle infinitive are not that. Okay, and I'm going to tell you that in a moment, but I'm just telling you. Now, here's what you have to know. The... The, uh, the main verb is, watch this now, the main verb is an aorist. That's pastime. It's an aorist passive indicative. And the two, the two participles are presents. And so something's occurred in the past that have caused these two present participles to get into some conflictual interest. Something's happened because one's positive and one's negative. The first participle is positive. He's a righteous man. The second one's a negative, right? Not wishing. Something's happened that's challenged his righteous position in Christ. Something in his life has challenged that, right? See that? And it is something occurred in the past of this present participles, 
and that's verse 18. He discovered what? He discovered something in verse 18 that Mary was three months pregnant. Okay. See, that's the heiress tense. The passive voice is that, he, that this is his internal struggle, what, has occurred, what he has discovered, has, has pushed him to the edge of his d doctrinal understanding. It, he, this, this event in his life, he's a, he's a spiritually mature believer. This thing has pushed him to the edge of his spiritual experience in the Word of God. Okay? You, you, God never pushes it beyond it, but somebody pushes to the edge of it. Great for First Corinthians ten thirteen. That's what it teaches you. All right, he never, he never pushes he never pushes you beyond what you have the capability of working way through. Right, that, that's First Corinthians ten thirteen. Listen, but if you're a smart, mature believer, if you're a spiritual mature believer, he's going to push you to the edge. You know why? Because on the other side of that edge is transformational living. That's at Romans 12, 1 and 2. And that's, that's the big deal. That is the big deal. You've got to somewhere learn that in your life. You're always going to be a taillight, never a headlight, if you don't learn it. So we have a main verb, it's the indicative, okay? And bulamai, now watch, see the word wanting? T-H-E-L-O, not O-L, but L-O, thalo. That's an emotional word of thinking. That's an emotional idea connected with thinking. Bulamai is the mental word trying to get clarity in my mind to be able to walk the process out. Keep, and here's what is happening. Here's the struggle Joseph got. Keep my emotions in check and think my way through with the word of God to be sure that I dot all the dots and, you know, I connect all the dots and cross my T's. And he used two words. Thalo is an emotional word, and bulamai is a mental word. Do you see his struggle? And all of this shows you that struggle. Okay, not wanting to disgrace aorist active infinitive. And, and, and then he brings us to another aorist infinitive, which is, and these are both dealing, Joseph's struggle about Mary. Pregnancy, Joseph struggled with Mary's pregnancy. We, we, you know, we're just verse, <laughs> we're just in verse nineteen, but we wouldn't have nineteen without an eighteen. Okay, and if he didn't have an eighteen, he wouldn't have the struggle he's got in nineteen. All right, desiring to put her away, that that would be the idea of divorce. That's an aorist active infinitive, secretly or privately. Now he's got a couple choices. Under Jewish law, he can divorce or, or put him to death. Death or divorce. Now, this is not death before divorce or is an option. I mean, it's either this or that. Okay? That's the option he's got. Because what does, what does he believe has happened to Mary? She's committed adultery from their relationship. It would be called adultery. Adultery carries a death penalty under Jewish law. Not under Roman law, but under Jewish law. Under Jewish law, and then divorce, there are two ways you can do it. Divorce, like Deuteronomy 24, there are two ways you can do this. Deuteronomy 24 and 25 talks about the difference between death, death and divorce, if you're interested. But under Jewish law. Divorce, he could divorce two ways. You could divorce two ways. You could do it publicly, or you could do it privately. I mean, you, you've seen people have big public divorces, haven't you? They, you know, we've seen this. 
it's, it's not like this is something new because people can do it the same way, can't they? They can... You've seen people probably go through some of the messiest divorces you've ever seen in your life. Families involved and shotguns and everything. And then you've seen other people do it. He has chosen to do what? Not to do it publicly. That would be what? Called disgracing her. Running her through the muck and mire of the, the whole deal. It, it, you know, th now you've got lawyers and now you've got you, you've got people hunting up dirt and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be messy. You know, you got private detectives and lawyers and, and he chooses to do it privately. And the, and his motive is he doesn't run or drag her through, drag her through it. OK. And then, so he's really struggling with this. Right. He's struggling with it. You could you could you could grasp his struggle that he has with this. Okay. Now, let me tell you something, because the participles are nominative. Both of them are nominative. Let me tell you something about that, that a nominative. Let me just tell you something about a nominative, because I, you see this down all the time. You, now I have a drama before me. Let me tell you what a nominative does. The, a nominative is a, where you get the subject. With the subject of a sentence, we call it nominative. But let me tell you what a nominative, at least in the Greek language, does. It, it designates. Now, a nominative always de designates. If you learn the case endings in the Greek language, which we do our class, the nominative, you say designation. But let me tell you what that means. The designate, it designates, the nominative, now listen to me, designates an object of consciousness that's associated with the predicate or the verb. And the reason that's important is that the, mind's in, the mind is involved and the emotions are involved. That's consciousness. When these two things get together, it's just which, which one controls which one. The key, the key always is to keep your emotions under control by the way you think. Don't let, don't let your emotions get ahead of your... A line my uncle used to tell me, I can't tell you, but what ne you never got before something else. But he's in a situation that's highly emotionally charged we could understand that couldn't we what he's battling with is is bulimai i mean he's he's his emotions are running ra r r rampant right now because he believes this wonderful woman that he's committed himself to live the rest of his life with went off for three months to the country and got pregnant by god knows who And I've got a problem. I got a major problem because we're supposed to get married this year. When she got back, we were going to, you know, she went off for three months. When she come back, we're, we're going to get heavily involved in how we're going to do our wedding and all that stuff. So when she got back, then we're going to put our wedding. We've kind of put it on hold because of Elizabeth. And when she gets back, it goes on the front burner and we got a date set. And we, you know, and she comes back. She's a mama. How did that happen? And so he's, he's got a situation in life that's highly emotionally charged. Like a lot, of, a lot of situations in life, they come with a highly emotional package. The wrap, you know, the Christmas gift is, in this regard, is highly wrapped in, in, in something that's extremely emotional. And what he's battling with is trying to keep that in the back seat while he's driving the car down the road doing a good job, not put everybody's life at risk. And that's Bulamai. And he is really struggling with this. He is really struggling with it. And he's struggling. On the one hand, he is so crushed that this woman has done this 
And yet he doesn't want to disgrace her. He doesn't want to, want to run her through the muck and the mire. She, he don't want to do that. He loves this woman. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. She tells me one thing I don't know. I mean, her story is way out there. Don't drink the water when you go to the country. I mean, <laughs> what is that answer? So, so, but listen to me. I told you the nominative. It, it designates an object of consciousness, something that's really got your mind's attention. One of those mind intentions that's so emotionally charged that you can't sleep at night. Now, it could be positive or negative, couldn't it? Just depends. I mean, sometimes you get so nervous about going someplace, you can't sleep the night before, right? Your, your mind's going like crazy. I mean, we all have had this. This is that kind of, and you battle, you battle it, you battle it, you battle it. You pray, and then you finally fall asleep, and then you didn't realize you finally fell asleep. You only have about 40 minutes. You got to get them to go to work or something. You know? <laughs> so, so, so it's a life. That's, what, that's the nominative case. And you see, this, is, this passage is all about nominative. And so it's important you understand that. Okay, it's, it's really important. Now, what's also interesting about verse 19, this whole passage, 18 through 25, is all about Joseph. It's Joseph's side of the birth story rather than Mary's side, which is in Luke. So it makes it really interesting. Yet in the first two verses, it's been all about her. Agreed? Look, in verse 19, her is mentioned three times. I'll tell you something else interesting about this that people don't pay attention to, but when you're high, in a heart, listen, if I was a counselor, I'd pay attention to all these things. If I was counseling this couple, I would pay attention to what I'm telling you to pay attention to because you want to help them. The first time the word her, Joseph, her husband, is used is genitive. It's genitive. Genitive is descriptive. Genitive is descriptive. And it qualifies what is modifying. So here's a story about Joseph, but Mary is the big subject. Right? Why is Mary in his story, why is Mary playing such a big role in his story of his life because verse 18 great the next two times now watch this the next two times her name is brought her is brought up notice this it's with the it's with infinitives the first time it's used it's in the genitive working off from two participles her name is mentioned twice again, but it's with aorist infinitives, which places emphasis on the noun. The verb, the ver a participle works like an adjective. <clears throat> now, so her is used in the most unusual way. It says, not wishing, not wanting to disgrace her is an accusative. And it's with an infinitive, working off a main verb, and then it comes back to put her away. The word her is an accusative, to put her away secretly. When you talk about an accusative, <laughs> you're talking about limits. An accusative puts limits to something. It's called limitations. See, the writer changed from a, talking about her. See, you can't see that. I don't know how you can see that. But when he used it the first time, it's, it, it's where Joseph's consciousness has is, is gone bunkers. Joseph, how come he can't sleep, man? You're not eating. I mean, you look miserable. What's going on? <laughs> Mary. Mary. This Mary didn't have a little lamb. Man. Right? Well, she did, didn't she? In the, she did have a little lamb. Uh, she did have a little lamb. Well, anyhow. Now, listen. Here's what you got to pay attention to about accusative. When you're dealing with what it limit, it limits action or end. 
we're either at the end of something or we're at we're about to or the we're about to come to an end or we've got we're limiting either action or this thing is coming to an end. Now watch what it's done. Not wishing to disgrace her, he desired he, now he's made a a a volitional choice having thought out the word of God. He's done the best he in other words, Joseph, what's the Bible say? 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 And, and but what, what's his, what, listen, what's he asking him? What's he asking the Bible? What's he searching in the Bible for? The answers to what? Adultery. Agreed? Well, he's going to do what to her? Not want to disgrace her, but I, I, Here's what I'm not willing to do, disgrace her, but here's what I am willing to do, divorce her. To put her away privately is divorce. He's just gone the private way rather than the public way. The accusative used with her, because he's come to a decision. He's made a decision. Agreed? He's made a dis decision. And listen, do you know what we learn about this? If you're in a situation like this, if you can bring it to some kind of resolution before you go to bed, you might get a night's rest. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, 25 to the end of the chapter, he tells you, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let your, listen, you should never let the sun go down on any of these kind of high charged issues. You should bring it to some kind of resolution as best you can. Otherwise, you won't get any rest. You kiss this night goodbye. You might as well stay up and drink coffee and, and feel miserable tomorrow. Because you're going to go to bed and get up, go to bed, get up. I'm, I'm talking about from sleep. You're going to go to sleep, not, you're going to wake up and not be able to, you're going to be all night, toss and turn all night. Eh, 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 eh. I do that when my grandkids get sick and, and are in trouble. I have to get some resolution. I got to go like, well, look, Father, I got to find some kind of resolution because I got to go to work tomorrow. I need to have a good night's rest. And so, look, I have a passage for that. It tells me to do that. Do not go down, uh, do not let the sun go down on this kind of a mess, right? If you want to get a night's rest, now if you don't want to get a night's rest, just, you know, just stay up and make yourself miserable. Joseph has done the right thing the right way, right? As far as resolving some things in his mind for his life. But here's the question. Did she commit adultery? No. So all this research and all this biblical scholarship that he's done has been on the wrong trail, right? He searched everything, the Bible, on divorce based on adultery, his choices. He said Mary's committed adultery and has run that gamut all the way doctrinally, ran it out, and has come to a conclusion about adultery. And listen, he's done it very honestly in his heart. He's a righteous man, and he's brought a decision to his life. He's going to do this privately, not disgrace her, but I'm going to divorce her. And he goes to bed, he goes to sleep. Because it's during his sleep that God speaks to him. And you know what kind of sleep you get dreams for in the Old Covenant? Deep sleep. Deep sleep is where you get your rest. God put you in, put him into rest. We call it faith rest. Put him into rest physically to be able to speak faith into his soul spiritually. He would like to do that with you. Bring it to some kind. Did he make the right, when he went to bed, did he make the right choice? Mm -hmm. He didn't, not as far as the plan of God. But as far as what he was after, he got a resolution, didn't he? It was wrong, but he was right in searching it out. Okay? Now, here's a great point. 
I, I don't know where I am on my paper. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't have any idea. But let me tell you, let me tell you. When you're a, a believer, spiritually advancing believer, you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. You believe that. Romans 1.16 says that's the power. The gospel is the power of God to save those who believe it. Okay. Here's what God promises you to do. If you're faithful with your, with your life with God as a spiritual maturing believer, listen, he's committed himself to you as your father who cares for more for you than any one person could ever care for you ever in this life if you took everybody that really loved you and cared for you up to this point in your life put them all together it wouldn't be a drop compared to how god feels about you yeah okay? you do know your heavenly father that way here's what he did with joseph he'll do with you he, he allowed him to run that thing so he could get into deep sleep because if you resolve those things before you go to bed you can put your head on the pillow and sleep. All right? That's the, I don't care if you're talking Old Testament or New Testament. They both tell you to do the same thing. He does it. He goes into deep sleep, and the Father speaks to him. An angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. Are you going to dream? You know, what do you think he's dreaming? What do you think he's dreaming about? What's been the high drama in his life? It's what he's dreaming about. It's what he's dreaming about. That's what he's dreaming about. That's what you dream about. Especially the last two hours before you go to bed. What the high drama in your life. I mean, it could be from a movie. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a dream, and you're, part, you're, you're one of the characters in the movie. You go like, oh, that's good. Isn't that interesting? Well, anyhow, that's just dreams. So he appears to him in a dream, right? He appears to him in a dream, and as we will get into our lessons coming, the coming lessons, he'll get into a dream, and he will correct it. Listen, God, God will intervene in your life. S -s -s look close the book on it tonight get some resolution in your life close the book on it have a word of prayer and tell the father thank you get a good night's sleep let the father listen i can't tell you how many times i've gotten things resolved i, I keep a pencil and pad by by my bed because i'll get woke up in the middle of the night like this and i'll have such clarity on something i was thinking about way back here on on a the word of God or whatever is going on, I'll, I'll get such clarity with it. I get up and write it down because in the morning half times I go like, what was that? What was that? What was that? It was so good. It was so good. <sighs> so I, I've learned to wake up. When I wake up, I, I write it down because in the morning I don't want to miss any of that. And then I get, it's another resolution. I found out that I can do that. I can go back to sleep and sleep like a baby. I, I guess. I don't. My baby's never slept that good, so I know that's not a good analogy for me. <laughs> All right. Now, I left some other information there for you on the, on the participle. Just because you're people that of interest, I'm not going to deal with it with you because I've worked my way through it. Let me, let me get a few points, and I got close tonight. I gave you, I gave you highlights of my message anyhow. <laughs> it was after Joseph discovered that Mary was three months pregnant, out of verse 18, that we are introduced to Joseph's great emotional, mental, internal conflict regarding Matthew 118. Joseph went from wooing to woeing. And he did that in a split second. When he got the news, his heart stopped beating. And here's a point. Here's a point. Your life can change your life could be changed dramatically in a split second of time. A phone call. And sometimes it's a phone call we weren't expecting. Sometimes it's a phone call we were expecting. It's different as far as drama. It, not necessary emotions, but the drama. The, there's not the shock in it. If you've known for several months that this could happen, then when you get that call, you, oh, I, <laughs> mm, 
but it's not shock. It was expected at some point. Shock is what rocks our world. When you get that call, you had you don't expect to get it. And 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 you shouldn't expect to get it, and you get it. It rocks your world. This is what Joseph got. And this is what Joseph is struggling with. He is struggling with this. And listen, you need to be a Joseph when you get that. When you get that news that rocks your world, I mean really rocks your world. You better be the the righteous person that is able to bring that righteousness into the into the in, into your life experience. Not just that I'm saved, but that the Father is in charge of the Christian life. Experiential righteousness is being able to bring righteous thinking into the most adverse conditions of your life. And Joseph is able to do that. This great internal conflict is revealed by the two present participles and the two aorist infinitives associated with the main verb, which is Joseph's mental desire and what he finally settled on and that was to divorce Mary privately. Joseph's world like ours will get shocked and rocked in a split second of time. For his, it was discovering Mary's un unexpected pregnancy. Listen, I hear this often. I hear this often and have probably said it myself. In hindsight, <laughs> yeah, hindsight's 100% in it. Hindsight, hindsight. In hindsight, Joseph will will say that he wouldn't want to go through. In hindsight, when this whole th when the dust settles, Joseph would probably say that he wouldn't want to go through this again. But wouldn't change a thing because of the transformational change in his life because of it. Listen, there are times when God introduces such things in your life that are going to push you to the edge of what you believe about God and his word. And when you hang with him, where it's no longer independence, but dependence, you just stepped into transformational life. You just stepped into the transformational life. It's beyond the edge. Transformational life. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. You need to be familiar with it. Because, listen, you're, he's going to give you some of these transformational concepts in all different stages of your life and growth. And there'll come those times in your life when he'll push you right out to the edge of everything you know and believe. And when you step over by faith into that, you will experience what is transformational life. And you'll never be the same. Sometimes it happens when you're unsaved and sometimes it happens when you're saved. For example, here's a transformational experience for Paul as an unbeliever. Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus, right? And the Lord gets him. I mean, he puts him through a mill, right? It transformed his life. John Dyer, you should hear his testimony on the front lines of Vietnam. And God intervened in his life on the front lines, the foxholes of Vietnam, and transformed his life forever. And you can have those. I got saved. Transform my life forever. I mean, it was a transformational life change. Well, other people don't have it so big. It's a transformational life change. It's not as big. But it wasn't because it wasn't dramatic. There wasn't that much drama involved in it. Right? The more drama. I mean, John Dyer, you ought to hear him. Now, he don't talk much about it. The woman at the well. The woman at the well in John, the fourth chapter, her life is never the same. 
this transform that's a transformational concept. It can happen to a very mature believer like Joseph, who's pushed in high drama right to the edge of what he believes to be the absolute truth and has to, listen, has to step out in absolute dependence on God. And when God gets done with them, like Job and everybody else, when God gets to them, it's such a transformation that their life will never be the same. And they would probably say, I won't ever want to do, ever do this again, but I wouldn't take anything for, the, for what I went through it. I can't tell you how many times. We've all heard that, have we not? We've probably all said it in some kind of minor phase of our life. This Joseph is one of the big ones. Okay? Here's the second point. <clears throat> The second point is Joseph is what he's relating to in his life is what we call experiential righteousness. Now, here's, what, here's what's important I, on your paper, and, and I want you to really get this. Phase one, phase two, and phase three. Here, and I'm talking about righteousness, plus R, God's righteousness. God's righteousness. When it's phase one is salvation, phase two is the Christian way of life, phase three is eternity. Okay? Now, phase one, talking about righteousness, just talking about righteousness. This is what we call positional. This is what we call experiential. And this is what we call ultimate. Phase one, salvation, positional righteousness. You, you get it? That comes with the package of salvation. You can never lose it. That's, that's forever. See, that's, that's 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's what that is. Here's the Christian life. This is where Joseph is. This is where Joseph is. It's a, this is the Christian way of life. This is experiential righteousness right here. And, and what I gave you is Romans 1.16 that goes into 17. 16 is the gospel idea, and the gospel takes you into 17, where it talks about God's righteousness that goes from faith to faith. In other words, just moves you along the moves you along the walk, because in this one, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. See, and that's the struggle. He's struggling with that. He's struggling with it. And so this Romans 117 comes from Habakkuk 2 4, which is used is used in Galatians 3 11 and, and Hebrews 10 something 30. I probably put it on your paper. I don't know. It's it's also in Hebrews 10 38 or something like that. 23. There you go. And then of course phase three, it, this could come out like Matthew 25, 46. Uh the righteous. The righteous go to heaven. The righteous go to heaven. You know, if you have phase one, you have phase three. How did you, how did you get positional righteousness? For by grace you are saved through faith and the gift of God. And if you have that, you have this. But you may not have that. Experiential righteousness depends on how you walk. If you, listen, if position, uh, experiential righteousness moves from faith to 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 faith down the road. So that's where Joseph is. That's that's exactly where Joseph is right now. Experiential righteousness is based on on consistency of advancing in your spirit growth maturity by inhale exhale of the word of God. It's all about 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Right here. If it doesn't work there, it won't work. You're not going to, you can have, you can be saved and you can go to heaven, but you're missing all this stuff on earth. You're, you're, you're missing the walk by faith. Th that's the key. That's, th and, and listen, that's where all the drama is, right? <laughs> well, high drama every day is high drama. S somewhere in you, if you have any wit of ministry in you, you're getting it every day. The more ministry you're engaged in, the, the more you're dealing with, if not your high drama, somebody's high drama. That day goes by in my life. I'm not dealing with people in high drama. I mean, high, 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 high drama. 
I hang up the phone and go like, oh, God. Shush. See, the conflict, the conflict in this one, the conflict is, the conflict is consistency in walking by faith and not by, see, that's a choice. That's a choice. And, and, and staying on top of that choice is really important. And I, I gave you some scriptures in there, well worth your, well worth your read out of 1 Corinthians. You know what we miss in, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 about all scriptures God breathed? You miss five things. The reason you inhale and ex exhale the word of God is because God, God automatically does five things in your life. Automatically. Watch what they are. This is all about inhale, exhale. These five things. If you inhale, exhale, you get these five things. Watch these five things. And they're all profitable. <laughs> Come on now. They're all profitable. We're all about profit, aren't we? It's all profitable. I heard some of the farmers today uh, complaining because their soybeans got rained. I mean, either we get too much rain or not enough, right? That's called farming. We lived off the Almanac when I was a kid. We lived, that was like the gospel to us as farmers. For teaching, for reproof, that's one. For reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. You got that? And here's the fifth one, so that. You could be equipped for four, see the fours? There are five fours for every good work. See that? Four, every good work. Look, if you just inhale, exhale. Look, the, the, the guy thought, if you just inhale, exhale the word of God, if you just walk by faith. You know the faith cycle? Inhale, exhale. You know, you got the inhale on one side, the exhale on the other. If you just do that, I will raise the crop. I mean, it, 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 is, it, it will be profitable to your life. I will teach you. I will correct you. I will train you, right? I mean, just, I will, I will do all that. If you'll just do this, it gave us the easy part. Just breathe. If you'll just breathe, <laughs> I'll make your life wonderful if you'll just breathe. I mean, that's not hard to do, is it? Most of the time, we don't even think about it unless we lose it, then we think a lot about it. That's called experiential righteousness, okay? Now, we saw in our passage that Joseph is torn up emotionally and mentally. I want you, if I put this on your paper, I want you to circle it because I don't have time for you to read it, read it to you tonight, but boy, you're going to need this. 2 Corinthians 10, at least 3 through 6. Now, a lot of you know that passage. You're not going to stay very long in spiritual maturity and you not, and he not push your nose into first, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. And you better, you better pay attention to it too. You better pay attention to it. Joseph has learned to not hastily make decisions. Here's what I like Joseph did. I, I heard this all my life growing up. Probably Sam, you probably too. Sleep on it. Don't make a decision until you sleep on it. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> sleep on it. Well, you know, what we learned from Joseph is experience is try to settle it before you or you won't get no sleep on it. But I've heard that all my life. Don't make hasty decisions, major decisions. Make, not a, don't make them hastily. Sleep on it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I tell everybody that has these kind of experiences the same thing as a pastor. And, of course, if possible, settle it before you. If possible, bring it to some kind of resolution before you go to bed. That will help you sleep. That's, that's, the, that's the best sleeping pill you could ever have. <laughs> now, remember Jacob at, at uh, Pinnell? 
this is where he wrestled the Lord all night. He's doing the same thing that Joseph is doing. He's doing the same thing. You know what his issue was? I mean, he was, he was, this, he was emotionally charged and bent all out of shape and everything. You remember what it was about? It was returning to face Esau, who threatened to kill him. That's why he ran away. Right? Yeah. His, his brother promised to kill him. And, and he's been worried about it, even though it's, it's, you know, it's been several years, he's worried about it. And so he wrestles. It's called the wrestling match. And, 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 the, and, the, and listen, the Lord commends him on it. Because, listen, you can wrestle with the Lord a good way or a bad way. In the first part of the wrestling match, he wrestled kind of bad. And so you know what the Lord did? He, he, he hit him in his hip. And, he, and, and listen, he limped the rest of his life to show there's a right way and a wrong way to wrestle with me. If you wrestle against my will, you'll limp into life. If you get resolution in the will of God, right, you'll, you'll find transformation. You'll find transformation. And listen, when he threw his hip out, you would have thought that would have been the fight would have been over, but it wasn't. He was going to hold on to him until he got an absolute on the will of God, the directive will of God for his life. He wasn't about to turn him loose. And so at the end, he prevailed. The Bible says he prevailed. <laughs> the Bible says he prevailed. Now, here's Joseph. Joseph, in his deal, he's in a whole different situation, but not without high drama. Lord, what are my options in the word for Mary's unfaithfulness of adultery? Give me a word. Well, you know, he searches it out. But listen, for those of you that might be involved through your spiritual maturity with people calling you, would you pray for me? Would, I have a problem. Would you help me with it, right? And they come up and say, what about, what about? Your first question should, you should ask Joseph. The first question we should ask Joseph, are you sure about Mary's pregnancy? Would that be a fair question? Joseph would, re would probably respond, knowing how he dealt with it. How else could Mary get pregnant? I know she is pregnant, Ron. And a hundred out of a hundred people say this is how it happens. A hundred out of a hundred people say this is how it happens. Now, if you want to take your survey, Ron, of another 100 people, you could do that. I think you'll find another 100 people tell you the same thing. People get pregnant because they have an affair with somebody. Okay. Then our second question should be this. We shouldn't leave it there. Our second question could be, is there any reference in the Bible, Joseph, for a virgin getting pregnant? Would that not be fair? Before we leave this discussion, even though the unanimous vote, 100 out of 100, uh, yep. <laughs> That's how that thing happens. Be fair to ask one other question because we're dealing with God who does impossibles out of, right? Does possibles out of impossibles. We ought to ask, is there any evidence in the Bible? Is there anything in the Bible that says anything about a virgin? And the answer is yes. Da 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 da. da. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, but same thing. Yeah. See, sure. Is it? Yeah. It's a, it was. It was a different looking Bible. Same word. Isaiah seven fourteen. You know who's going to show up? An angel of the Lord is going to show up and give him Isaiah seven fourteen. And I go like, geez, I could have had a V eight. That stupid commercial. And here's my point. Here's my point. God intervened because of Joseph's positive vision towards the word of God. See that? He just 
Listen, he just did a, a job. He made a false assumption that led to a false interpretation that led to a false expectation that le led to a false application. That's what he did. But listen, he had positive volition. He was seeking out the Lord's will. But he didn't ask another question. Is it possible? Did the, does the Bible ever say anything about a virgin having a baby? That would have been a fair question because he knew she was a virgin. She knew she was a virgin. He, as far as he knew, she was. It was to him anyhow. <laughs> Joseph would learn several important doctrinal lessons from the test of transformation. I want to mention two because I don't have time. One from the life of Job, which I just shared, and another from Genesis and the life of Jacob when he wrestles the Lord. They, both men are doing it. You and I do it. What the Father wants you to do is get your head in the Word of God. All right? Ask all the questions you can ask to the Word of God before you draw a conclusion, right? Here's what he said to Jacob. Now, this is powerful. Your name is... When he, when he gets through with Jake, when he gets through with Joseph, he's going to say, your child's name will be Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. To Jacob, he says, your name will so no longer be Jacob, surplanter, but Israel, he who persists with God. I mean, the last person you want to give up in this life is God. You, you want to persist with God. Yeah, it means supplanter. Yeah. For you have striven. Listen to this. For you have striven with God. Stri striving. You have strived with God and with men and have prevailed. You know why? Because he turned. Listen, got to the edge. Stepped over there. Independence of God. Independent of God. Not interdependent, right? Dependent on God. And when he does, steps out there, right? And only faith could do it. Then God does it because what God has promised, he's able to do. Not only, not only able, but Joseph will say willing. So take a look at all that, okay? Here's what our Christmas lessons will tell you. God is faithful every minute of every day. God is faithful every minute of every day. Well, I think it's worth pointing out that if Joseph had made it public, that he would have made it public as to the reason for the divorce, meaning that she was pregnant. Yeah. By doing it privately, he took that guilt upon himself, that mm -hmm. blame upon himself from a public perception because yeah. he didn't. Well, yeah, they, everybody's going to assume that it's his, and they did. Because he had made a promise, he had made a commitment to her for marriage, and now he was the one, or it looks to the public like he was the one breaking that promise. So, let me tell you, let me show you how nasty the enemy is. You're, you're absolutely right. Let me show you how, how brutal the enemy is to your life and mine. The enemy, the enemy of God. In John, the eighth chapter, Jesus, a grown man in full ministry, the enemy threw that in his face, that he was a child of fornication. But you have to be, you have to be steady on your feet, don't you? But he knew who his father was. But everybody else didn't. They called him, they called him, you're a child of fornication. In the old King James Version, that would be you're a bastard. You can say that religiously and get away with it. <laughs> yeah, enemies brutal, aren't they? Brutal. They're brutal. That's why they need to be saved. We were, we were them. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these to come our way and study with us.
Pray the Holy Spirit would minister truth of the word of God to our lives. What have we learned tonight from Joseph? Stay with God. Search out the scriptures the best you have. Come to some resolution. Sleep on it. Don't make a hasty decision. Listen to counsel that comes to you after, after that. Listen to the wise counsel. Look into the word of God and see if there is a change that's necessary before you make the final decision so that it can be compatible with the desires of God's heart, not just the desires of man. And when we do that, in these highly charged atmospheres where the word of God is supreme in our life and only God himself could do it, we have transformation. We have it in such a way that it changes. It's a benchmark in our life. We can always go back to that benchmark in our life where God intervened in such powerful way in our life. We thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.